Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's session, Examining the Black Art Ecosystem. I'd like to thank you for your patience as we uh, kind of work through the technical difficulties, but I promise you this evening's conversation will be well worth it. My name is Leslie Guy, and I'm the moderator for this evening's session, and I run an art-based consultancy in the Chicago area. And I'd like to uh, introduce you to the panelists who will be um, speaking today. They kind of cover the breadth and the depth of the um, art world with their experiences, and we are in for a wine-raising and comprehensive conversation. Um, our first panelist is Diane Dickens Carr, who is the president and founder of BBC Consulting Group Inc. Hi, Diane. She I is an artist creator and a con <laughs> there's so much in your bio, it's great. <laughs> she is an art appraiser and she has a consulting company uh, uh, where she works for individuals, collectors, architects, designers, institutions, a plethora of organizations. And she works tirelessly to bring awareness to African-American art and artists. Diane is a very active member of the art community and instrumental in keeping the legacy of the oldest African-American African art center alive, the Southside Community Art Center, where she served on the board for 30 years. Um, our next uh, panelist is Garbo Hearn. Garbo is the director of Hearn Fine Arts, where she's uh, that she began in 1988. HFA has represented and exhibited work of regional, national, and international artists of African descent. In 2004, Hearn became a certified fine arts appraiser. Hey, Garbo, you're on with us. Good. <laughs> and um, she became a certified art appraiser in 2004. And our final panelist is Deborah Roberts, who is a mixed media artist whose work challenges the notions of ideal beauty. Her work has been uh, exhibited internationally across the US and Europe. Roberts's work is in the collections of the Whitney Art Museum, the Brooklyn Art Museum, Studio Art Museum, LACMA, several others. It's a very impressive <laughs> list. <laughs> and she has been also the recipient of numerous awards and residencies, including the Rauschenberg Residency. And Barbara received her MFA from Syracuse, and she currently resides in Austin, Texas, which is why there's so much light in her background, and we're all jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to welcome you all. And I guess if we can get everybody up here, because we're going to have a group conversation. Okay. So welcome, everybody. Um, and um, what I wanted to do with the first conversation for our audience is ask each of you individually a question uh, to talk about your lives so that, and your careers so that our audience can get an idea of the scope of the art of the black arts ecosystem because you three of you represent really distinct segments of that. So I'm going to start with you, Diane, because you're in the center, and I'm going to uh, ask you to talk about your experiences as a trustee, a collector, and an arts appraiser. Well, thank me, thank you for having me this evening. I'm really excited with this group. Well, I served on the board of Southside Community Arts Center for 30 years. In 1990, Margaret Burroughs asked me, along with Marion Perkins and Julia Perkins, to sit on the board because she wanted some younger people to be involved. Well, Marion and Julia served on a couple of years and kind of jumped ship on me. And I forgave them, but I stuck with them. And in 1998, I was voted on as board president and chair where I served in that position until 2011. Being on the board and being the board chair, trying to continue Margaret Burroughs' legacy was very important to me because Margaret was the one that introduced my parents. She was my mentor. I saw a lot of artists and art movements that came through the center from the afro Copra movement and the Wall of Respect side, I really didn't take advantage of really, really 
you know, learning about those various movements then, because I lived it. You know, my parents was always involved from Calvin Jones to Bill Walker to Elizabeth Kelly, Gordon Parks. I guess I just took that for granted. But I wanted to continue Margaret's legacy of making sure the center's doors was always open for the artist. They had a place to come and place to do their art and exhibit their work. We was one of the few art centers that had auctions every year. And from that, that's how a lot of African-Americans started collecting art was at the art auctions. And from Alan Stringfellow, William Carter, McBride, to even the younger artists, Andre Gachard, Fahim, Jason Jones, Gerald Griffin, Paul Brad Branton. A lot of artists have came through those centers doors. So being a board president at that time was very important because I wanted to make sure Margaret's legacy was kept alive. Now, as a collector, um, that's different because back then we wasn't considered ourselves collectors. I just you know, people bought art because they loved it and they supported the artist. Now it's a new thing about collecting art. I'm going to, you want me to go on or should we let Deborah or I'm Garbo? Gonna, I'm going to open it up to, to Deborah and Garbo and then we're going to, we can begin our group conversation. So um, I'm going to turn to you, Deborah, and ask you to talk a little bit about your trajectory because you have your career encompasses the scope of the art world as a visual artist. Right. Um, well, yeah, I am. Um, I'm Austin based uh, mixed media artist. I started off doing what is considered now the black um, the black uh, romantic art. And uh, I did that for several years. Um, I went off to grad school once my art started to change and um, and to, to figure out what was happening uh, with the art. Um, I, I understood that literature played a big part of my work. And so, you know, I started doing my collages at Syracuse University. I came back out of graduate school, um, I couldn't find a job right away. I ended up working at a shoe store for about a year, a little bit less than a year. And I went to New York City, had an amazing show at Volta, uh, the art fair, and uh, sold a lot of work. And, um, you know, the rest is history after that. So, um, yeah, I've done it all. I've done street fairs, uh, done home shows, everything. And um, Garva, I'm going to throw the same question to you. In 1988, my husband and I were young collectors and we decided to open a gallery in Arkansas. Uh, we wanted to fill a niche because there was nothing in Arkansas showcasing African-American artists. So from there, um, in the late 80s, we met Frank Frazier. He introduced us to um, Paul Goodnight, John Biggers, and the likes of those artists. And so from there, we have shown emerging mid-career and master artists uh, throughout our career. We have worked with all types of collectors from the seasoned collector to the new beginner, but basically our goal is to educate from both ends in terms of the artists, to let them know that they have to have a strategic plan as well as the collector moving forward in this whole system of art. Um, we showed at the National Black Fine Arts Show in New York during that era. That was a really exciting period for us because we met a lot of artists and we brought them to our state where they, they would not have known about Arkansas. Arkansas would not have known about them and they were very successful. So that's been our journey and uh, we continue to work with artists and you know we just love what we do. So, well, thank you all. And um, the, one of the questions I have, and I think it's probably could be in a lot of people's minds, is that what your careers show and the, the breadth of your careers is, show, is that there has always been 
a black art market and there have always been people who are purchasing black art um, and interested in it. On the other hand, if you were to look at media now or see things now, a lot of people are assuming that this is something that is new. And so what I would like to know from you, from each of your perspectives is to what do you attribute this to, um, the newfound interest and recognition of black art and artists? And I'll let whoever wants to tackle it first, tackle it first. Well, um, um, this new thing about black art is the end thing. I just don't understand because black art has been around for many years. And I think it started with the uh, um, auction houses where maybe a couple of Kerry James Marshall, Marshall pieces went, broke the record for 21 million. And then some of the recognitions that some artists are getting at Art Basel and other fairs in the Benelli. And I think other, other cultures are starting to really understand that African-American art, Black art has a value. And it's been around for many, many years. And maybe because of the Black Lives Matter, what's going on now, it's getting a lot of attention. But really, even when my parents were helping artists, I always knew about Black art. I just don't understand why it's such getting great recognition now, because that's why I grew up around was the William Carter's and the McBride's and the Catlett's. So to say that black art is a now thing, if it's been with me for over 60 years, but I think really the auction houses are really, really bringing attention to um, African-American artists. Some of the trustees at these various museums are really stepping up to say that it's not a representation of African-American art. And some of the board trustees at these museums are really making a difference to make sure there are curators and that the presidents of these museums are really stepping up to make sure these artists are represented in these major museums. I'm gonna I throw I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm, take it away, Garbo. Well, I think, you know, the black art, just like anything, goes in cycles. And I had the pleasure of showing the work of Henry Tanner, Robert Scott Duncanson, Charles Ethan Porter, and Bannister um, about 12 years ago from a collector's work. And if you, all of their stories, they were free black men who showed their work and they they pretty much all died in poverty but at the same time their work continues to be shown today and if you think about um as samuela lewis says that um, art is not a luxury it's a necessity and it there our artists are our storytellers and if you look at what's going on today with our social with the social injustice the artists are coming forth and they are the storytellers that are putting it out there and showing what's going on. So I think that the cycle of us being left out of museums and moving forward, that whole thing will continue and this, this cycle will end and another will start. I have a, I get a question for you, Deborah, in that vein. And um, when you started to talk about your art career, you talked, you, you know, kind of spoke of not a, a stylistic evolution so I wanted to know from you in terms of your art and how it was received, um, how has that changed? Over, how has that changed over time? And are about the different types of black art? Is black art all types forms of black art received the same in all places? So I'd like you to talk a little bit about about that. 
Mm -hmm. I always say that uh, there's multiple art worlds. There's just not one art world that people navigate in and out of different ones. And uh, for me, uh, when I did the um, the more narrative works, uh, I had I thought I was a successful artist. I've thought I think uh, all my life I've been a successful artist because I've worked at it and I was earnest in my approach to it. Um, I think Garbo was right. I think that right now uh, we're in the land of milk and honey and the new renaissance and every artist is um, um, getting their opportunity to showcase their work and to uh, to get their voices out. Uh, for me personally, it's been a, a long journey and one that I'm very proud of. Um, it's just, you know, being at this this high point in my career where my work is uh, in demand is just uh, have been overwhelming. But um, I've I've approached it with the same vigor that I've always approached my work. So um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> so out of curiosity, do you feel the same freedom at this height of your career to say what you want in the ways that you want to say them, say it or not? Right. Well, I'm I'm gaining more 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 freedom. Uh, for me, it happens so. I mean, I was working in the margins of African American art and art, uh, and it just after New York, it just happens so fast. And just you know, I always tell people this is idea that God smiled on me and it just poured out all these blessings at the same time. And so I'm just now um, getting more control over it and um trying to slow it down a little bit and also um you know just making sure that my voice and the work that i put out is really clean and crisp yeah it's uh it's a lot of work <laughs> that seems like a good thing though <laughs> yeah it's a great thing <laughs> the, other, the other side is not so good <laughs> that's so good yeah. So, um, Barbo, my, my question to you on, on that front is, as a gallerist, I'm sure you've seen artists at many different points along in their career. So I wanted to know for you, in terms of educating both your buyers and, your, um, and the artists that you work with, how does that work for you? And how do you help artists kind of navigate this ecosystem? First of all, you know, working with artists is to uh, encourage them to always do the best work and never to sign their name unless it's completely finished and, and technically done right. And that's got to be the most important thing for an artist to realize that the technical aspects of their work and what they're trying to get across has to be consistent in each work that they do. And as they grow, and move into other areas and do bodies of work, you can see that growth. And what we try to do is we work with artists and every two to three years, we bring them back so that the collector can see how their work has grown and also the appreciative value of their work. Because I think that uh, once an artist realizes that this is what they're gonna do in their career, what you know, whatever path they take, they have to keep that earnest um, belief that if they do good work, they're going to get compensated appropriately. So I don't, I don't like um, artists to be that one hit wonder to do that one piece and continue to do that one piece over and over. I, I discourage that if they continue to grow and do bodies of work from that end. And from, from a collector's point of view, I always say you buy what you like, you buy what you love. You know, don't buy a piece of art to uh, fit into a particular room or match furniture or whatever you buy it to fit wherever you go in life and, and as collectors grow in terms of uh, the type of art they want to buy. They may start with a limited edition prints and move into original work but again the best art that you can buy and buy what you love. Uh, Debra, is there something that you're hoping for from your buyers in terms of how they're living with your art? Um, not, no, not really. Um, sometimes I get photos, you know, from, on Instagram that people show me the, the work and where they placed it. And um, right now, I'm um, I'm pushing my work toward institutional 
uh, purchases. Um, I, I'm thinking about legacy. It's, it's taken me a long time to get this type of attention. So I, I want to be in the canon of contemporary art. So one way to do that is to get into really major, very good collections and also to be in institutions. So this last year or so, I've been, um, you know, me and my galleries, um, one in Los Angeles and one in London, we've been focused on institutional buys uh, and sales. Um, but it's important that for me that more people see my work, that they are able to, um, you know, walk around in museums and, and read my story and to, to Google me and find out about my practice and what I want to do with my work and why I chose to um, use little kids in my work, uh, little black boys and little black girls. So um, that, you know, institutional buys, I mean, sales for me are very important right now. Um, I'm gonna go back, any of my collectors on, I'm gonna, we're gonna start making more work available, but right now, um, <laughs> you know, um, I'm trying to get into the Museum of Modern Art, you know, so. That, okay. So each each of you in your own way, and I wanted to talk about a little bit about institution buys versus individual when we're talking about this ecosystem, is um, in terms of institutional buys versus individuals, do you t tend to target certain types of work to certain environments? How, how, does, how does that kind of work for you? I guess I'll start off with you, kind of, Garbo, do you find that institutions are interested in certain things, private clients in another? Institutions usually have a goal. They have a strategic plan of what they need to build their collections. So when they come to you, um, looking for particular artists, they have a pretty good idea of their budget and what they're interested in from that artist. So they are uh, pretty honed in on what, you're, what they're looking for. Individuals are a little more uh, just f what they like and what they feel, but institutions are definitely on point of what they're looking for. And I know that you, Diane, have worked um, for collecting organizations. So, uh, yeah, so I'm interested in your take on that. Well, the museums probably are listening more to their trustees of color of what should be in that particular museum that they sit on the board. I noticed a couple of the uh, museums are forcing, I'm not going to say forcing, but bringing more awareness that the board they sit on for these museums don't have a good representation of Black art. And the Black board trustees are really, really forcing their hands of these museums to include black art now now some of these trustees i don't know what black artists they are pushing to be in the museums but i noticed over the past i would say 10 years when i visit various museums i'm seeing a little bit more african-american art hanging on their walls and not only of the um, black masters, I'm starting to see younger um, African-American artists um, work in some of these museums, but I'm sure that's because of the board trustees of color are really in the hands now of these institutions, which I'm very happy because I grew up as a kid at the Art Institute. So I really didn't see any art there, any paintings that represented what I saw on my parents' walls. And one day, probably over 15 years ago, it took me approximately maybe half a day just to find a Charles White. And I went through the whole museum. And true, they might have it in their collections, but it's in storage but some of those pieces need to be 
brought out and hung, ex exhibited, and not only every five years when they might represent an artist of color. And these museums always want the community to come see them instead of have fight with the Art Institute all the time. You need to go to the community until the community can really understand, because a lot of times people don't come out their community. And a lot of these institutions want the community to come to them. Museums are very, are very intimidating. The Art Institute doesn't bother me because I grew up in there. You know, I was took classes there as a child, but what the institutions, these museums, they always want to say the community to come to them. Well, if you are now welcoming, welcoming and you are a cold institution, they not going to come. So you need to at least get a bus, put some little miniature exhibits in there, and take it to some of these schools. And then the kids will say, oh, that's at the Art Institute or at the MCA. Or so, any really any art um, institute. So I guess to so that end, I wanted to ask you, Deborah, about you as an artist and what kind and about leveraging power to affect change in the organizations that collect your work. Do you feel that you're in a position that that can happen? Are institutions willing to listen to you in a way they weren't before? Um, I don't know. I don't think I'm in the position right now to to be able to demand things from the major museums. I've, um, I think I'm in a lot of ways, even though I'm an older person, um, you know, I'm not an ingenue, but, um, you know, things have finally turned my way into contemporary art. So I think to some degree I do, I can, you know, leverage whatever power my galleries have to, to, to ask for certain things, but, um, I'm not Glenn Ligon or um, Adrian Piper, um, you know, Kende Wally, these major um, art people who can probably have more power than I do. Um, only thing I can do is make sure that the right, my work is done right and uh, that is put in institutions that will show it, you know, within the five year uh, program. Um, <coughs> You know, so I, I think I think right now, as a group of African American artists, we do have a lot of power. But unless you wanted to live like the top ten of them, you know, um, going to see curators, directors, uh, and asking them to to and be more inclusive, um, you're gonna be on a long wait list. You know, so I mean, I, I would love to go and. Um, you know, talk to the board president at, at, at the Met and say, hey, put more black people on the walls. Uh, but they have Wengechi Muto um, right there in front when you walk up to the museum. She's on both sides of her work and it's beautiful. So uh, they are trying to make some um, inroads, you know, but more has to be done. We know that. I definitely agree with you, Deborah. I think institutions are changing and that they are hiring younger curators and they are hiring curators of color. So I think that's changing and that's changing the face of uh, definitely museums in the South. I see the younger curators coming forth and they're looking at uh, contemporary artists and they're, you know, they're changing the scene and, and they're showing the work. Uh, definitely at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, they are making a real effort to show African American artists and do uh, programming, not just in February. So I think the demand community, it has, it goes both ways in in changing what happens in institutions. Absolutely, you yeah. don't want to uh, not. Um, I know a lot of artists run from February shows because it's so uh, it's just it's so narrowing. It just no one wants to be pigeonholed. And the only time that your art is accepted into the contemporary world is during February, you know? So you're right. Um, a lot more um, museums and galleries are, are making an effort to, to show artists year round, which is important. So how has 
the internet impacted what it is that you all do? Because among the many art worlds, that's another one. Um, well, especially during this one. time. During oh. the... yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, Garbo. Go ahead. I was saying. Well, I was saying during this uh, time of the pandemic, the COVID nineteen, uh, the internet has been a real help. I think uh, technology has changed. You know, since they we're not gathering, uh, using virtual exhibitions and Zoom programming is a, are, you know, is allowing artists and patrons and collectors just like this uh, program that we're doing now probably wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for the pandemic. So I think the internet has, has made a big change in uh, the ability of an artist to show their own work and, you know, Instagram, social media has changed the face of, you know, what an artist can do and how they can show their work. So it's, I think it's been a tremendous help. Yeah, for Stand me up. too. I mean, it's uh, been, it's it's been it's been great for me. It's been great for me able to, um, um, to to showcase my work. Um, I I do uh, Instagram all the time. Um, I'm I, I use it as a tool, just like I use any of my craft to to tell people what I'm doing. Um, um, you know, just keep them informed and my practice. So I think that, you know, it's just like the thing that we use to get our work out. Um, you know, if you're not on the internet showing your work, then you're far behind, way behind. I really believe that. So to that end, a question just came up from the audience uh, that helps like segue on to that. And this is the question. Do participants have plans for how to work during the pandemic with restrictions on being in person? So what are your plans for forwarding what it is you do with the current restrictions that we all are living under? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm still working in my studio. You know, I mean, you know, if it wasn't for all the dying and the being very sick, I mean, for an artist, this is a perfect time for you to really, you know, get get into the studio and, um, you know, buckle down on your work and figure out what you want, what you want to do with the work. So for me, with all these these restrictions, um, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's perfect to really to do a new body of work, to to think about, to do some reading, do some writing. It's just, it's very good, you know. For me, my gallery is still open. Uh, we practice uh, sanitizing. Of course, you have to wear masks. Uh, we have a great opportunity to engage our patrons uh, in terms of intentional appointments when people come in. They're spending a lot more time at home and so they're looking at their walls and saying, you know, I need to update, I need to change. So now when patrons come in, they, they have a plan and an intention. So it's really been um, good for me. And it's also given me an opportunity to sit down and connect with artists and patrons from the past. So I think it's, a, as Deborah said, it's a great time to plan because this will be over probably in the next two years, hopefully, and we'll go back to a new normal, but this is a great opportunity for us to plan for the future. Right, right, that's true. I have to agree with that too, because this is making people think in other directions. Um, artists, you know, like Deborah said, creating new work, really think about what direction they want to go into. Me as a um, fine art appraiser, I haven't really appraised anything in person since I've been in since March 15th. And I'm still getting calls from clients. I send them an email saying, due to COVID, I will not be there in person, but we can do Zoom, we can FaceTime, you can send me images, and we can do it that way. So it's given um, not only appraisers, and I mean, some appraisers have really been affected by this, where we are not, that, um, the organizations, the appraisal 
Foundation, along with American Society of Appraisers and the other two organizations, they are really leaving it up to the appraisers on how to handle this. No, I am not going out, but I will, you know, talk to the clients and tell them how we can do Zoom, walk around. To Now, I can't appraise 20 or 30 pieces, but it also makes the client think, do I need all those pieces appraised? Maybe one or two or three pieces. So on the consultant side, I'm still mentoring a lot of young artists. I'm telling them this is a great time to really think and sit down to get in tune with yourself. Because once this is over, I don't want anyone complaining someone else has gotten ahead. I'm even taking advantage of taking more online courses, you know, broader in my knowledge in different areas. So um, we do have time for... Oh, please go ahead, Garbo. I was saying this is a great opportunity for collectors to take time and inventory their collection, to go from room to room and decide, is this something that I want? What do I want to do with this? You know, and do I want to give it away? Do I want to give it to my children? This is a good time for you to just take sight of your collection and decide, is it time to update my appraisal? What am I going to do with my art? You know, so it's a good time to keep that in mind as well. So to that end, a question just came in for you, Garbo, but I invite others to um, to answer too after Garbo has a in it, but it is for you. Um, and the question is, is there a distinction between works by African-Americans and works by other ar artists from the African diaspora? Is there a distinction in the interest or there is a distinction in price? What? I, I'm not sure. They didn't specify, the so I'm, I'm going to let you take it um, in okay. every, any way that makes sense because there's lots of ways to tackle that. Okay. I mean, from my direction, you know, I represent um, artists from Ghana, from Botswana, and, you know, it, it doesn't seem to play a different role. I mean, either, you know, the intent and the technicality and the work of the artist, it, the impression, it doesn't really matter whether they're African or African-American is, do they like the work? Can they afford the work? So I think the interest is the same. There's no real distinction from, from my point of view or from my clients to date. Um, so I'm, I'm going to um, wrap that question that was asked into another question and not about distinction, but potentially preference because one person has made a comment that they feel that um, African American men are getting more um, recognition than African American women. But I, the other question that I will kind of also wrap into it because I've heard the similar things is some people feel as though African artists are getting a lot more attention too as well. So I'm going to ask, um, I think Deborah, I'm going to ask you to tackle this one and I will circle back <laughs> to you, Diane, too. <laughs> you start with the women, with the men versus the women, if you want to. <laughs> well, I mean, it's always been the point where, you know, just like white men have always dominated the art world and are in most of the institution, um, women don't have as many solo shows and museums and galleries. We know that. Um, so I don't think there will be any difference when you say uh, black men are getting more attention than black women. I think that we can you know, put pit ourselves against each other and saying um, that one is getting more than the other, or you can just keep doing your work and hopefully that people will see it and recognize it. Um, but, you know, the art world is slowly changing. It, it's, it's a, it has a long and storied history. It's not going to change overnight. And all you can do is just keep doing your work and hopefully that someone will recognize it and show it. Um, as far as works by African artists, yeah, it is a, more African artists are getting more uh, attention as well they should. And like Garbo said earlier, the art world moves, it shifts, it moves, it's not just one thing, uh, it's multiple things. And now African art, uh, figurative work 
is is getting this is coming into the uh, the market. It's coming into uh, shows and 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 fairs and things like that. You know, Sotheby's, everything, every place. And for you, Diane, any thoughts on this subject? Well, I never looked at it like that because I collect African American art, you know, African art, and when it comes to the um, male artists, there are. Uh, and it seems like a lot of attention on the male African American artists and even the African artists, because as I think. You know, even though I know uh, various women artists, it's yeah, the attention is really drawn on or drawn to the male. And I want to know why myself is it. I just, even in my collection, I have to think back, I do have a lot of work by males, African American males. I do have. Um, the African American female in my collection, but it seems like my collection is dominated by the male, and I never even thought about that. Maybe because I see more African American male artists. I have a lot of African American male friends that are artists, and I, you know, I have female artists, but it just seems I never thought about that. I mean, I I don't know if they are not. I see them at different exhibits. And I see them at different shows selling. Maybe it's just a male-dominated, you know, market. I don't understand. I'm glad that um, Deborah Roberts, you know, I got to, you know, purchase her book and, you know, thumb through some pages. But I'm glad that she is in the museums now, and maybe. It would change the mind of the collector that to take a second look at their collection to see if they have African American female artists in their collection. Okay, so um, I do have a um, a question. Uh, this one actually was directed to Diane, and it circled back to a, a, a something you mentioned earlier. And um, it was about um, mentoring and wanting to know how artists come to you and how you select artists to mentor. And I will also kind of ask each of you to um, answer that as well, because I'm sure for each of you, each of you in your own respective way has mentored somebody. So I'm going to give it to you first, Diane, though. I really don't know how they come to me. They you know, they might call me for one thing and then I ask them, what are they doing? Or even some artists that I'm familiar with are just starting out. I tell them to look at their work, to make sure it's their best work. And say, why are you doing this? Uh, I try to tell them about the, if they're going to sell work, do they have the right contracts? You know, most artists, See, I'm different. Even though I come from a family of artists, I do know the business side. Most artists just like to create. They love their work. They love to create. They get in their little corner and all they want to do is create. Some want to release their work to various galleries because they it just becomes part of them. So I tell them to go to Southside Community Art Center to see if they can get in a group show. I tell them to really do various art shows, art fairs, to get their name out there because the customer, the collector, whoever's looking at their work will give them their honest opinion or will say, yes, I come back. But a lot of time artists, you know, that I mentor, it's word of mouth. They might call Southside Community Art Center. They might Google me. And I, mean, I talk to them like, I understand it's hard out here, but you need to do some group shows or talk to some gallery owners and get your work in there. So it's either word of mouth, Southside Community Art Center, or they might happen to come across my name. And plus, I guess 
by me being in this field so long, they just say, hey, call Diane. And when I was a child, I didn't really understand this. A lot of people are always calling my parents, especially my father. And I'm like, why are these people calling you? Why are you the connector? Why can't they go out here and find their own information? And now it seems like I've taken the role of my parents where people are calling me for, you know, advice or direction or what should they do even in their career. So I guess my name is just out there. <laughs> I, I mean, I hate to say this is not arrogant. I just, people just call my office and we might start one conversation and I might say, well, have you thought about this? Don't get pigeonholed. Do this, do that. Go back to school. You know, become a curator. You know, if you want to have a voice, become a curator or become a gallery owner. Go to galleries and talk to the owners and see how you can get in their gallery. And a lot of time it's just networking. So um, to that end, um, Garbo? For me, you know, I, as a gallerist uh, over 32 years, I often artists come to me, through, they, they email me, they bring their work to me, but I'm, I never discourage an artist to continue. I want to know, is this, gonna, is this a hobby? Is this, do you want to be a professional artist? Do you want to make a living doing this? What's your strategic plan? I always can, I encourage artists to educate themselves. If you know they're in high school, take the right courses, move forward. You want to go get a degree in fine art, then do that. Go back and get your MFA, but continue to educate yourself with even if you do uh, community art classes, because there's there's a place for you in this creative world if you want and if you want to work toward it. So, education is what I push for everyone, and and I ask them to look at their work and see if they have a signature approach, if they can. Um, find something in their work that sets them apart and then to draw on that. So that's, I think, how an artist is born because every artist is always uh, influenced by someone and don't be afraid to say influenced by someone and you like that person's work, but can you take that person's work and make it your own and, you know, make your, make a name for yourself in the art world. So, um, a question that, that I do have is, um, it would be a little bit about mentoring, but also asking uh, about um, what has changed over the course of your career and what advice are you giving now to people that you might not have given you know, any number of years ago? <laughs> I will start with that one. <laughs> I mean, the only advice <laughs> I would tell people is uh, because it was a long, it was a long road to home. Um, I would just tell people is stay focused, and even though you get a lot of no's, um, believe in your practice and believe that you can be successful at it, and um, don't listen to other people. Uh, keep your eyes on your own, on your own paper because sometimes. You see that other people are getting things and you wonder why you're not getting them. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's not your time yet. So um, that's the advice I would say. And then I said, don't, don't, don't feel afraid to ask curators, other artists to come in and give you critiques of your work. Because sometimes you're in the studio by yourself and you just, you end up, you go down this rabbit hole and you can't get your way yourself out of it. You, sometimes you need fresh eyes on the work, you know. So um, that's the advice I would give. The only one, get advice. For me as a gallery owner, <laughs> I would say, um, you know, for 32 years, we've changed our strategy. Don't be afraid of change. And don't be afraid to move forward. Don't be afraid of technology. But right now I say, that um, the best move as a gallery owner is collaborating, is collaborating with other galleries, with institutions, with the community, because the only way that as a gallery owner, I'm gonna move my artists all around 
um, the United States and internationally is to work with other people. So collaboration is a key word for me. Diane, for you. Um, just do what you love. I mean, when I was in art school, I, I had a really bad because it seemed like every professor I had either taught my father either at the Institute of Design or Howard, so I couldn't get away from it. So I went to college thinking I could have a little bit of free time, but it seems like every professor I had from color theory to topography, see, they didn't have computers then. But it's, even the assistant dean knew my father. So I had to really stay on the straight path of learning every technique from photography to color theory to art therapy. So with me, if just stick with what you love. If you're going to be an artist, stick with it. It's not like you know, Deborah said, or Garbo, you have to really, really perfect your talent and your skills. Don't be afraid to dab her in photography, um, collage, learn various mediums. Um, what you Don't might get start- Don't collage, too many. <laughs> <Okay>. Sorry. <laughs> Don't get into collage. We got enough collage. It's, 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 it's so Do it insulation. Do insulation. Insulations or photography. You know, that's an art form. You know, acrylic painting, anything, insulations. You know, don't be afraid to test the waters because that's the only way you can learn various mediums. Like with me, I've, I've just been blessed from doing photography, um, painting, drawings. So I really got even ceramics, tie dye. I used to teach tie dye and batik at Southside Community Arts Center during the summer. So I look back at everything I, you know, was taught. So even today, if I got it out of this whole art of phrasing, consultant, I can go and become really a fine artist because as a child, I learned various mediums. So I just want everyone just do what you love, stick with it, you know, just make sure you learn everything about your craft and talk to other artists, talk to gallery owners. That's the only way you're going to learn. So um, we are, this has been wonderful and I know that we are running out of time. So there are actually two questions. One specifically is for Deborah, and there's a, a viewer who wants to know how you got the cover of uh, Harper's. So if you could let them know how that happened. Um, well, um, um, I did a cover, um, I think right when we went into um, quarantine, um, they um, they contacted my London gallery and yeah, there it is. And they said that they wanted to do some work, um, um, what artists were doing and what they were feeling during quarantine. I presented the work uh, to them um, and they put it on that digital cover. And they said they got such a huge response and then it went on uh, to Harper's uh, Japan and Germany. And then they said, well, we're going to do a, a big art feature later in the year and I want to use one of the works on the cover. So I sent them two design. I knew which one they were going to pick. And I sent them two and they picked the one I thought. And that one is called The Unseen. And, um, you know, it was just amazing. It was so beautiful. My cover sold out right away. And, uh, and it's hard to get. I mean, it's really hard to get because it's in Europe. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, it was so amazing. Uh, I've gotten so much response from that. It's been overwhelming. So that will segue well into the very last question <laughs> and I'd like to offer this. But the last question is about legacy. 
And that is, um, what do you think your legacy is and what would you like it to be? Um, I'm going to begin and this one with you because all I can think about with that question is, of course, Margaret Burroughs. So I'm going to give it to you, Diane, because when I hear that word, I always associate it with her. <laughs> um, I'm still trying to keep Margaret's legacy alive, even though I, you know, resigned from Southside Community Arts Center's board in May. But I just want to make sure that people, Margaret Burroughs, you know, she taught in the jails. She used to make sure everyone knew about collecting art. So my legacy is just to make sure everyone has a piece in their home, some art on their wall. Margaret used to just pass, out, pass her work out on the corner, her prints, because she feel, felt as though everyone should have a piece of art on their wall. So my legacy that I would like to leave that there should be no blank walls in no one's home. I don't care if you have to cut a page out of a magazine and frame it or what, put art on your wall and just, it just makes you more relaxed and just feel you would change when you can look at that piece that you enjoy. So the legacy is to make sure Everyone has at least one or two pieces on the wall that they like. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you have to um, cut out a bizarre magazine and put in a <laughs> Yeah, we all want one of them. <laughs> uh, if I ever asked the question on legacy, uh, like I said earlier, I want my work to be in the canon of art and art history. I want in a hundred years, if someone's looking or teaching art history and they get on a part of 20th, 21st century art and and look for who were doing works and they go to uh, different types of work and they get to collage or mixed media work um, that my name is mentioned somehow in, in, in the same breath as Romare Bearden and um, Wengechi Mutu and um, Hannah Hawk and just great people who use collage as a way, as a powerful agency to talk about beauty and black identity and the body. So um, that's the only thing that I can hope for. Well, I like Deborah and Diane's No Blank Walls and the point is that I want my, our legacy to be about excellence, that we provided uh, a change in Arkansas and we continue to provide that and that there are no blank walls and that African-American uh, culture and history is shared through uh, the visual arts and of course, literacy. So excellence is what I want my legacy to be about. Well, I would like to thank you wonderful women. This conversation has been an engaging and enjoyable, and I am sure that our audience is really glad that they stuck with us through those technical difficulties because this has been fabulous. And I'd like to thank um, Black Fine Arts Month for hosting this conversation, and I wish everyone a pleasant evening and go buy art. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Pigment International and the DeSable Museum of African American History, in association with New Day Culture, present the second annual Black Fine Art Month celebration under the theme, A Woman's Work. A month-long virtual experience celebrates Black women making profound contributions in the fine arts arena. It features weekly panel discussions with art world luminaries exploring the contemporary black aesthetic and a virtual exhibition. For full details, visit blackfineartmonth.com. That's blackfineartmonth.com.